Georgi, are you ready for your presentation? Yes, I am. Okay. So I'm just gonna browse. Why? So Windows. Okay. There we go. All right. So I'm. Yes, I'm ready whenever you are. All right. Go right ahead. So, uh, as part of the organization of this conference, I want to express my like enormous pleasure of all the great talks so far and all the wonderful ideas. I'm inevitably going to kind of show similar things or reiterate or repeat things and then look through a new lens, which is obviously uh, there should be an intersection if we are describing the same phenomena. But uh, I summarize this under a title, which is uh, self organization and cosmic evolution. And uh, I'm gonna unpack this in the few slides that follow. Uh, but those terms were invented at different times in history. You no know, self organization actually has is a very old um, like tens or, or hundred year old term cosmic evolution is I heard for a first time like again about it but uh, I'm, I want to kind of explain in my view how the two of them support each other so okay so to start with, um, I just wanted to remind, I'm sure most of you have seen the Cosmic Calendar by Carl Sagan, and just to remind you about the uh, a feature that I think it hasn't appeared in too many of the talks today, which is the enormous acceleration of growth of order in the universe. And I'm purposely not using the word complexity since we heard from Peter Corning and other, others uh, criticism of using that term since there are many tens of definitions and people could get confused. But the word order or organization is much more clearly defined and I will uh, describe how I quantify it in my own uh, terms. But um, the, the, the striking feature in the universe is that uh, somebody mentioned for uh, unicellular organisms uh, for three and a half billion years, there were single cell organisms and they would, they, with a Cambrian explosion, right? For the very few moments since then, we have this enormous variety of multicellular life and civilization. So there is this acceleration happening, which is, if it's an experimental or observational fact, because we see it in many systems and we see it also in our own technological system, as I will show uh, shortly. But the cosmic calendar, just to remind you, is that uh, Carl Sagan, um, just for aesthetic purposes, mapped the whole uh, history of the universe into a year and roughly since they're like 15 billion years in of the life in the universe since the Big Bang and 12 months each month is a little bit more than a billion years and uh, the cosmic calendar starts on January 1st uh, when the Big Bang is at midnight and then for a bunch of months which is billions of years uh, there are things happening, but not, not on a scale that we consider like a landmark in the structure of the universe until May when the uh, Milky Way galaxy disk forms. And then for a number of years, uh, according to him, not many appreciable things are happening until the solar system in September uh, is formed. And shortly after that, uh, photosynthesis and uh, in October, in November, eukaryotic cells. So things are going still not very quick, but in December, in the last few days of December, we notice an enormous 
exponential acceleration of sponges, fish, land plants, insects. On December 25th, we see the dinosaurs appearing, mammals on 26, Pangea splits on 27, birds, and the uh, humans, the apes appear at 10.15 a.m. on the last day, humans at 8.10 p.m. of the year, Homo erectus and modern humans migrate out of Africa two seconds before midnight, and uh, one, uh, oh, sorry, two minutes before midnight and two, one minute before night, midnight, the Neanderthals in the last minute is on the bottom graph, on the bottom, um, I'm sorry, here where uh, we see that, let's say the uh, glacial period stops at around 46 seconds, agriculture uh, settlements start at 22 seconds before midnight, first cities appear 16 seconds before midnight, dynastic China is less than 10 seconds, and Christ and Muhammad are like four or three seconds before midnight, and Columbus arrives in America one second before midnight. So what does this tell us? That not only there is a tendency to increase order, or for lack of a better word, to self-organize matter. I would say in, accord, in, in agreement with many of the talks today that it's energy-driven organization rather than self-organization. The energy is doing the work. The energy is providing the structure of the systems. Um, but uh, it's happening, not only it, it's happening, but it's happening faster and faster, right? So not only it's, the universe is not going into a heat death and it's not decaying into entropy, but on the contrary, it's going faster and faster towards order, which is a mind boggling uh, observation by Carl Sagan and others, if you think about it. And uh, <clears throat> here I want to uh, move to the next slide. So here is uh, another source uh, of information about the accelerating rate of uh, self-organization. And uh, Modis took um, all these uh, 16 different sources. One of them is Carl Sagan, but they're the Encyclopedia Britannica, the British Museum, the different sources of information about uh, organizational, self-organizational self or uh, structural events happening in the universe, uh, they call them paradigm shifts. Since the Big Bang and the x-axis is logarithmic, um, which is time before present as uh, on the far right is today, and on the vertical axis is time to the next event in uh, billions of uh, in years. And we can see that the, the longer uh, in the past we look, the longer we needed to wait for something significant to appear in the universe, some structure, some new organization, but the closer we are to the present, uh, the time to the next event is less and less and less and less, which is again um, supporting this concept of acceleration in all the, from all these uh, different sources and from different directions. Again, uh, mind-blowing. Uh, a person who was a good friend to Carl Sagan while he was at Harvard uh, is Eric Chaison, who I met at Tufts when I was a graduate student, then he moved back to Harvard where he is today. And we meet from time to time. So he, he made actually this poster while he was still at Tufts University. And on the bottom, you see the right center where the um, he puts uh, this concept for cosmic uh, evolution on this conical shape where not only we have acceleration in, in time, but also we have expansion, right? The cone is getting bigger and bigger. And, and those two things, he's adding a new dimension to uh, the, the cosmic evolution by Eric Chison, but, but not only systems, um, getting more complex uh, or more, more organized and faster, but also they are uh, kind of spreading more and have the ability to, to occupy 
larger volume or uh, in phase space or in real space. So for him, this arrow of time is not the arrow to increase in entropy, but the arrow to increase of order. And he goes from particles to galaxies, stellar, planetary, chemical, bio, cultural, and whatever future evolution is coming out uh, from this. So his website is very interactive. You could click on any of this and see wonderful videos and information if you are interested. Um, and also he proposed a metric to describe not only the observation that there is increase in order and that order is increasing exponentially faster and that order is spreading, but also that we have a way to correlate at least with something that he calls um, free energy rate density abbreviated as FERD in the title here, which is most simply put the disequilibrium or the distance from thermodynamic equilibrium of a system, which is the, a measure of the energy flows through the system as this energy flows are necessary to do the work to build the structure, build the flow channels in the system, as Adrian Bejan started today with the flow uh, networks and also maintain them in time, right? If you stop the flow of energy at any time, the systems will just fall apart. So not only build the order, but maintain, you need to keep the structure of those organized systems. So what he found, what you see on, on this uh, page is that um, starting from galaxies, stars, planets, and all the way to society, you see this uh, exponential increase of uh, energy flowing per, per unit mass. So this is ERC per second per gram, which is ERC is a unit of energy. It's proportional to a joule per second per gram of matter. And the higher you go in organizational level, the more energy flow per unit mass is recorded. So stars, uh, galaxies on the very bottom, even though they they're the most visible structure, but they're so big that when you divide by their mass, they have very low energy density. Then stars, planets, and then plants and animals and uh, society and technology is even higher. So um, <clears throat> again, uh, this captures all four aspects of cosmic evolution with the according to Eric Chaisson, the cause for all this, which is the flow of energy. And uh, we could correlate this to Adrian Bajan's principle for easier flow of energy through those systems. They need to build structures. Um, here I want to add another observer only for the last part of this uh, acceleration, which is Ray Kurzweil. Uh, who is the C, uh, chief technology officer at Google right now, but uh, he uh, found a similar trend in the CPUs. Uh, the, these are the, actually he finds super exponential growth in uh, computing where calculations per second per thousand dollars is growing super exponentially. Uh, now the thousand dollars is uh, not a physics concept. So if we don't use that, we get more to uh, uh, not a double exponent, but a single exponent. But nevertheless, what's interesting is that he's very much into this, um, studying the acceleration, not just the increase of order. All right. So what is my personal preference in thinking about all this? So my approach is to use to start with the very basic and simple uh, concepts to answer these questions. Why is there this exponential acceleration of order in the universe? And um, uh, variational principles were mentioned a couple of times today about entropy increase and about other things. I'm gonna mention a principle which there is a controversy about which uh, LAP stands for the least action principle. Those of you who are physicists probably have used it a lot to derive the Euler-Lagrange equations and all, pretty much all of physics, including quantum mechanics, relativity, um, 
even thermodynamics uh, or any branch of physics, not even speaking to pl about classical mechanics, optics, electromagnetism, everything in physics is derived from this principle of least action, which most simply put is to um, derive the derive what happens, right? Derive the, the equations of motion, how things move in nature. Let's say if you drop an object or if you throw a ball on a parabola, you could derive uh, where, where it's gonna land by using the least action principle. Of course, you could do that with Newton's uh, equations, but um, with the least action principle, with variational principles, you could do a lot more. You could apply to fields. So how do we use this principle? Well, we theoretically try to expand it for complex systems, compare that uh, to data, do some simulations that I'll show you and do some experiment experiments let's say something simple like uh, experiments with Bernard cells, uh, which uh, we did at uh, the Worcester Polytechnic Institute with uh, Atanu, who, was, who is a student there. So, uh, and we talk about connecting um, the measures for the complex or for the complex systems or organized systems with cybernetic terms in positive and negative feedback loops. All right, so, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it, what is the principle of least action? It states that all processes in nature everywhere occur with the least expenditure of action, which is the product of, most simply is the product of time and energy since we have the Lagrangian, which is energy L and T is the time for that process. And we have uh, I is the action I, uh, has the units of joules uh, times seconds. So here the variation, the delta is the variation is that we've, if the shortest trajectory is, let's say the red trajectory from one to two to get from the start to end point for a particle, uh, any of these other trajectories are longer and therefore, at least in classical physics, they are not taken, only the straight line is taken, which is called a geodesic. Uh, in quantum mechanics, of course, they have some probabilities. I think in um, organized systems, there is also probabilities for longer um, trajectories to be taken, but I'll explain that later. That's because there are obstructions for the motion. Of course, this is very simple and uh, two objections that could be raised of using it to say, okay, this is the stationary action because the first derivative is zero, it's just stationary, not least. But uh, for uh, meaningful physical problems, if you take a second uh, derivative, sec second variation, you'll find that um, most often it's uh, a minimum and you could argue from simple uh, basic uh, availability of energy and time. If you, if you have a process that, uh, that occurs and if you ask for the probability to occur with uh, for the, with maximum or minimum expenditure of energy and time, uh, there is only so much energy available that the probability for the maximum uh, action will be close to zero. Uh, another objection that could be raised is this is for conservative systems that don't include energy dissipation, but I'm, my goal is here to give you just the basic idea that we can use this principle and there is a lot of recent work from 2019 and 20 in dissipative uh, Lagrangian dissipating variational principles um, that are used to derive non-equilibrium thermodynamics that, um, that uh, that's a very well developed uh, branch. Okay, so how do we expand the least action principle to systems, to organize systems? So first those are systems that um, have many parts, many, not like uh, uh, an object in a free fall, which is uh, the interest in physics, where you describe how single objects move and there are no interactions in uh, uh, systems that we're interested in, in self-organizing systems. There are a lot of interactions. Sometimes people call them uh, contact dynamics. They study that with contact variational principles. Um, 
but the most simple way that I could present to you now, the idea is that uh, only if you imagine you complicate the system to just two elements from one, from one object moving by itself on a geodesic on a straight line, which we saw in the previous slide, imagine two objects which their paths cross, right? And they, they have some obstacles, so they both will interact with that obstacle, do some work to minimize, but what will be the best configuration of the system is that the sum of the action for each of the two elements to get to their final point, the sum is a minimum, not the first object has a minimum trajectory at the expense of the second or the second at the expense of the first, which will destroy the system, right? They will disconnect, but they, the, the organization in a system is the position of those obstacles to motion in such a way that here we have the variation of the sum of the actions of all elements around the, along their trajectories is what is extremized, right? What is going to zero. So for us, that is the, uh, the on one hand, uh, a measure of which organization is uh, better than another. It's the one that is closer to this state of, of zero variation. If you look at this cone, that will be at the bottom and then uh, a system that is more disorganized will be on the, on the hills here or on the slopes. And uh, also that could provide a quantitative measure about how much uh, is the organization compared to systems. Okay, so again, we vary not the action of one element, but we vary the sum of actions of all elements in the system. And if we say that that sum is a minimum, then we could define a quantity, which is alpha, which is the quantity of organization of the system. And it says the following, See, here H is just a constant, it's the Planck's constant, it's, it, it's a number, it's not so interesting. What's more interesting is the numerator N times M is the, in a flow network, the number, if you have elements, the number of crossings of each element per unit time so n elements do m crossings. So in, an, in other words, that's the number of events in the system, the, num, the number of crossings. If that's a computing system, that will be the number of computations in a CPU. If it's a biological system, it could be the number of ATP molecules produced or the number of sugar molecules in photosynthesis pr produced. Uh, if it's a engineered system, it could be the number of joules produced in a power plant, you name it. For your system, what are the events that happen? And here is the cost for those events in terms of action. So what is the sum of all actions? And of course, if the denominator is a minimum, the system is in the most natural state of motion, right? The, the most, the closest to the Newton's laws of uh, uh, motion, uh, that brings, the number for organization to the, the maximum, right? So the, the most organized state alpha will be when we have the least expenditure of action of, for all. Uh, of course, there could be huge fluctuations for individual elements, right? And um, <clears throat> here we could just rewrite this to, to be more simple, like uh, alpha, the organization on the bottom is just the phi is the number of events, n times m, and q is the uh, quantity of um, action, which is the sum of all actions divided by h. So we have the flow divided by the total action in the system is the measure of its level of organization. So in that graph that you saw by Eric Chaisson, I would put on the y-axis, not the names of systems, but I would put this alpha, which is um, in other words, the action efficiency of the system. And Peter Corning talked earlier about efficiency as measures, which uh, we could agree with uh, some of those <clears throat> notions, right? So the action efficiency is in this terminology, in this formalism, the measure of uh, the level of organization of the system. All right, so let's apply this to 
uh, a system that is easy to to check. And what I want to, to do here is to expand it. So on one hand, the least action principle says that the system tends to a state with least action, uh, which contains in itself, if you think about it, not only the measure, right, the least the action, the lower the denominator, the larger the organization, but also an attractor state, right? So in other words, if the system is at lower level of organization or if it's disorganized, it's attracted towards this a state of, of lower action, right? It may never reach the state of absolute lowest action because it's a dynamical open system. It constantly has flows of energy and materials and it has fluctuations, but the attractor is this least action state, which is built into all uh, physics laws and uh, the Newton's laws and all of physics. And not only that, but I would argue, as we saw in the cone of Eric Chaison, that this action efficiency as tendency to increase, which is alpha, or I would call also the, the quality of the system, right? The organization is the quality, depends on, uh, as in the cone of Eric Chaison, on the expense of the system or on its quantity, uh, or in his exponential graph, he had the free energy rate density, right? So the free energy rate density will be the more energy you pass through a system, this uh, Q, the more structure you could build uh, alpha. But there are other quantity measures like the number of elements in a system. And if it's an organism, that will be the number of cells. If it's a economic system, I don't know, the number of uh, economic agents. And the flow phi is the flow of events, right? If it's economic system, it will be number of dollars, uh, transactions, if it's, um, or trades, if it's a computing system, the number of bits transmitted or computed. So what I want to do is connect all these uh, in cybernetic terms with a positive feedback loop and say that each of them reinforces the other, in other words, the size or the quantity of the system or the free energy, the larger the free energy flowing through the system, the more structure it will build, the more action efficient alpha uh, uh, the system will be and the more events it could uh, do. And the more elements it has also, it could have more events and more efficiency, it could organize itself in a better way. So how do you represent um, a system? Ge Georgie? Yeah, we're down to four minutes. Um, <laughs> we, we, I'll uh, it, yeah, I'll stop. Whatever. Oh, you mean? Uh, okay. So, how how much do I have to talk? Uh, uh, you minutes? have a you have about four minutes left, and there's one question waiting. Yeah. Okay. So the way we represent uh, the way it is represented, if you open Bertalanffy or General Systems Theory or any other cybernetics book, is the rate of increase of any of those. We call them interdependent functions, the characteristics of a complex system is that the rate of increase of each of them, alpha, q, phi, n, depends on the, all the others. So the greater the others are, the, the faster the growth of each. So we see how we're not only getting uh, organized system, but we're getting the rate of organization and as the solutions of this uh, system of equations, we get strictly exponential solutions, which matches perfectly the intuition of Carl Sagan with the cosmic calendar, or Eric Chaisson's uh, intuition with the free energy rate density. But here we have a model that predicts exponential increase. And when you take those exponential equations, you get power law dependence on each of them. And here I'm showing just one verification, as I promised at the beginning here, we get the uh, uh, this is a very simple, the transistor count in, in the Moore's law uh, as a function of time, a log linear plot. This is an exponential predicted by uh, the equations in this model, but also uh, with uh, Atom, Atom who made these plots is, uh, we look at any of the other quantities. This is the flow versus time, strictly exponential in computing systems. Uh, the uh, amount of free energy uh, flowing uh, through 
CPUs of computers exponential. Uh, the action efficiency of CPUs here on the upper left, exponential in time. So all match. So, so this fits the model with very high confidence. Look, 97 on the R squared, uh, 94. And these are the power law relations between all four characteristics. I'm not gonna comment on each of them because I don't have time, but you could see that all of them are with very high confidence matching the predictions of this model. And uh, this again, a blown up version of the free energy rate density. So what I want to say is that uh, this is one example for CPUs, but uh, I have students at uh, Assumption that uh, collected data for biological systems, for metabolic cycles, for photosynthesis, ATP production. Um, we looked at uh, data for Bernard cells and other systems. So we see everywhere this uh, positive feedback loops in physical, chemical, biological, social, economic, engineered systems. And what I want, what I'm interested is in uh, how universal is this model? In other words, to how many different systems I can apply uh, this uh, system of equations and still have predictive power, right? And uh, probably I'll skip over a bunch of things that I wanted to say. So in other words, uh, to <laughs> flip uh, Eric Chaisson's uh, uh, cone, I want to say that here we have this uh, increase of time upwards and the lock of all characteristics of any complex systems. And they form this beautiful cone where from particles from the Big Bang, we go to current civilization and the future. And we expect those to encompass more area in space. And uh, I'll just stay with this. I'll say thank you to all of you who have interest in this. I'll be happy to talk more if anybody is interested and send me an email or, or call me and I'll be happy to discuss more aspects of this or find common ground to collaborate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much to both Todd Hilton and Georgie Georgiev for their presentations. I'm afraid we're out of time for this session. Uh, we now have a 15 minute break. Uh, we will be reconvening uh, at 3.15. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.